Okay, so you should see this big uh, screen right now that says my name. <laughs> Here we go. This is like, uh, what is the future of the artist talk? We don't know. This is not it, but this is coming from the old school. I'll give you something of a formal talk. So again, my name is Caroline Willard. I'm a white woman wearing a flower print shirt with my hair pulled back. I'm really grateful to be here. And I know that at this moment, it's the end of the day for some of you on Friday. I welcome you to bring your whole selves into the Zoom. If that means turning your video off and relaxing and lying on the floor or being comfortable in whatever way is best for you, I welcome that. I love that there are babies in this Zoom. I welcome all of the cats and dogs and babies and birds and grandparents and anyone else in your space. This is the time of flowing with all of our lived realities. I'm zooming into you from the unceded ancestral territories of the Monacan peoples, land that was forcibly taken by white settler colonists. I honor the past, present, and future Native peoples of the Monacan Nation, as well as the sacred land and waters of this place. I invite you to consider your commitment to the ongoing intersectional work of acknowledgement, structural reparations, and intersectional repair. As a white woman with a mixed race and blended family, with my white ancestors and family benefiting from stolen land for generations, and by assimilating into whiteness and being racialized as white, I want to acknowledge the legacy and present day conditions of settler colonial violence. I honor the past, present, and future indigenous peoples who inhabited, continue to inhabit, hold sacred, and steward these lands. This is intergenerational work. And now I wanna take a moment to call into the Zoom room, the reality of this moment, and to welcome the care and support that makes our presence here possible. We are all holding a lot together. And if you've started writing an email or multitasking, I invite you to come back to this Zoom for a moment and look into the blue square you see. I invite you to think about the human and non-human beings that support you and that make your presence here possible. I'm thinking of my dad who was first generation to college who never would have thought someone in our family would have an opportunity like I have today. And I'm thinking of my son who's in the other room with my wife trying to be quiet so I can present here. And again, if you hear a baby, that's who it is. I'm thinking of my teachers of all ages who have helped me on this path, friends and collaborators. And I think of us as a kind of collective, like a flock of birds. Please take a moment to send your gratitude to the human and non-human beings around you. Yes. Perhaps you saw a yellow glow, an after image. Let this after image and the song of birds be a cue for the residue of support and care in our ongoing transformation. I also wanna thank Amy who's here, who consented to let me share this email. 
uh, back in December when my son was six months old, I had no idea how to build relationships on Zoom. And I wanna thank Amy for writing this email to me out of the blue, introducing me to her work, and then in turn getting to know her and having her introduce me to Bina and Stacy and the team at Costco. I am a big believer that we are the community that we might want and that we can build the solidarity economies, the economies of care and reciprocity that we want to see. And so this talk in itself was made possible through this kind of trust and bold relationship building. And I will give you my email at the end, it's just my name at Gmail. And I love these uh, exchanges. You never know where they might lead. So thank you, Amy, for making this possible. And again, thank you to Bina and Abby for organizing this with Mao. This is what I plan to do, although we are in a flow together. So again, if you want to unmute yourself at any moment, and say, let's get into the informal discussion. There are really incredible people in this synchronous moment together. So we can also talk more informally. So this is the plan. Again, we can alter it as we like. And if you're in the workshop tomorrow, these are the questions that Bina and I are thinking of that can guide what we discuss tomorrow. How do we prefigure the mutual economies that we wish to see? What are you unlearning now? What can we practice together? What would we each like to unlearn together? What mutual economy vis-a-vis -vis capitalist economy are you or we practicing? What mutual economy can we not make together? How do we prefigure the mutual economies that we wish to see. I often work in large collectives that are interdisciplinary with many people coming from outside of the arts. So as I begin, I want to remind myself and all of you that there is a real difficulty in representing collective work and describing it in a talk like this. I hope that if you're interested in some of these practices and projects, you follow up with me by email so that we can be in practice together, or I can connect you to the people who are practicing that I've mentioned that you might want to meet. I often ask, what can I bring to a collaborative interdisciplinary solidarity economy project as someone trained in the visual arts. And I like to say, I can create objects, sculptures, and also systems or institutions or infrastructure or protocols that allow those objects to circulate. I think as artists and creative people, as culture bearers, however you identify, we can both imagine and enact the kinds of economies that we want to see. So as an artist, I often do that with printed matter, whether it's a kind of currency, with websites to think about the networks that we move through, with objects, sculptures like these, installations, and also a process of co-creation with collaborative invitations to join each endeavor. For example, for the past few years, I've been creating sculptural objects for groups to use in gatherings. Pictured here are collaborators, Anita Chari, who is an associate professor of political science at the University of Oregon, and Esteban Kelly, who's the director of the US Federation of Worker Cooperatives. And they both have a real interest in the ways that groups gather, how to be together, and what artists might do to add to the process of gathering. For me, I believe that sculptural objects can add tactility, play, the nonverbal, and sensation. My mentor, Alta Starr from Generative Somatics says, sensation is the fastest way to get into the now, into the present. 
And so if you've started to lose me in this Zoom space, if you have a glass of water or some kind of uh, material near you that might wake you up, I encourage you to touch it, put your hand in a glass of water, feel your skin, get a sense of the now that we are still here in this moment. And sculptural objects can do this. They can bring us into the now in ways that are not possible with spoken conversation alone. This is an object I made recently that's based upon a medieval watering can. You submerge it in water and cap it with a finger and then bring it anywhere. And when you release it, the cap comes off, the suction flows and water comes out. Most recently, I've mailed these objects to people who use them on Zoom and therefore have to step very far away from their computer, which uh, for me is satisfying. And I started working with Jeff Warren and Aisha Jandazova to make packaging so that these can go to the library in Philadelphia in the US. In thinking about solidarity economies and practicing together in groups, I've become really interested in how artists and creative people, designers, culture bearers create collaborative methods. And so if you're interested in this, you can go to studycollaboration.com and learn more about how different artists I've met have developed collaborative methods for learning and unlearning. And I welcome additions that we could put on this site. So that's an overview. Take a moment to let that sink in. There's the residue of the care that makes our presence here possible. I want to tell two stories. We might only hear one, depending on the energy. And welcome to the people who are joining us now. I have noticed that when I'm on Zoom, stories are what make the space feel excited and connected to me. So bear with me. This will be a first personal story and then much broader story to ground uh, who I am and how I situate myself in this work. The first story is about toothbrush packaging. I was not supposed to become an artist. I was not supposed to become a designer. I was lucky that my parents took me to museums and galleries as a kid. My mom talked to me about the industrial designer's role in making a toothbrush. And my brother and I looked at toothbrush packaging and talked about what we thought made good and bad design as kids. But then at some point, my mom said I was too interested in these conversations, too interested in making art. When I announced my desire to go to art school to focus on this thing that they had talked about with me, they dismissed me. Somehow the conversations about art and design, making my own clothes, and spending all of my time drawing had been for them a way of making do or playing acceptable only for a child or a teenager as part of their image of class assimilation. The new message they sent to me was this, that was good for you as a child, but life as an adult does not allow for play or leisure or indulgence like this. Toothbrush packaging can't be a full-time job. And then they told me, you'll never make a living as an artist. Art school is for stupid people. Artists are dumb, you're smart. If you go to art school, you'll never be a professional. 
You'll never own your own home. And then really painful comments like this. If you go down this path and become a starving artist, how are you gonna take care of us when we're old? Look at all we've done for you. We never had opportunities like this. And because my dad was first generation to college, his path was very difficult. And he talked openly with me about his desire for me to become a doctor or a lawyer, something impressive. And so the fights between us raged on. And as a teenager, I was stubborn and I pushed back. And I said, I will make a living as an artist. Artists are not stupid. We can be some kind of alternative professional. And I can take care of you, my dad, when you're old. This began a commitment to economic justice and the arts. For me, they always go hand in hand and it's both personal and political. And along the way, I learned about the solidarity economy movement where all of these collective efforts from mutual aid to worker co-ops are connected together in strong networks of support. And those of you who are coming from Colombia, Italy, Quebec, France, South Korea, Ecuador, Spain, Cape Verde, Japan, Indonesia, Malaysia, in many places, you know about the solidarity economy movement in ways that are only emerging now in the United States. The solidarity economy, for those of you who like definitions, is a term used to describe sustainable and equitable community control of work, food, housing, and culture using a variety of organizational forms. The term solidarity economy is relatively contemporary. The term emerged in Chile and France in the 1980s, gained popularity in Latin America in the 1990s, and spread globally as an interdependent movement after the first annual World Social Forum in Brazil in 2001, where we know the slogan, another world is possible. The solidarity economy is now recognized internationally as a way to value people and the planet over profits and to unite grassroots practices like lending circles, credit unions, worker cooperatives, and community land trusts to form a base of political power and transform our economy. Most people are aware of the discrete practices and models, the ones that you see here, for example, but most people don't know that there's a term that holds these concepts together and a global movement that may be very close to their own home if they start looking. The idea to visualize it is that all of these initiatives, whether it's a mutual aid network, a housing or worker cooperative, a participatory budgeting process or a public bank have community ownership and democratic governance for political, cultural, and economic power. And this is Namaka Agbo's restorative economics theory of liberation, which is used here with permission. Again, there are many principles, but the core ones are around cooperation, participatory democracy, intersectional equity, sustainability, and pluralism. And we can get into how those are lived in practice in the conversation as we open it up. Again, the emergent movement goes by many names. You may use instead economic democracy, helping each other, mutual aid, beloved community, the new economy, democratic socialism, dual power, community wealth, just transition, self-determination, degrowth, the commons, local community economic development. But internationally, I connect with the social and solidarity economy movement or the solidarity economy for short. And I can also share this presentation at the end if that's helpful for people who wanna read the text at length. Here are some examples of groups that are doing this work right now from a recent report that I created with Nati Linares that I will talk about. So you can see that there are arts-based groups involved in this work. And as an artist, I've wondered, how can I support the desires that artists and all creative people have to help one another that are often hindered by the existing institutions in the arts around us? And I've co-founded 
mutual aid and barter networks that began in the last crisis of 2007 and 2008. I'll just show you what they look like. One was a one-to-one -one barter network, and the other one was a skill sharing software that allowed people in different countries to adapt it to their needs. And we did it completely open source with uh, no money at the time. And I can share with you also, Or Zubalski built the software and many collaborators, including Louise Ma and Rich Watts supported this as it developed. Rachel Vera Steinberg was also very involved. And I can connect you to those collaborators if you're interested. Most recently, I've been involved in working on permanently affordable space. I helped with the media working group for the New York City Real Estate Investment Cooperative. As a group, we asked and then said, we can pool our money to invest in buildings and land for local, cultural, and cooperative uses to take land off of the speculative market forever. Most recently, with Nati Linares, as I mentioned, we created a report and a website at art.coop to think about the connection between economic justice and arts and culture. So what does it mean to build a mutual economy as the uh, title of the talk from Bina and Abby implies? I think it means that we can practice on the scale of an interpersonal and then collective and potentially regional network, maybe even international, the care that we know is central to the art making that we're already engaged in. So that if you have someone in your life who doesn't believe that artists are smart or that artists can have livelihoods or that artists can care for their elders, you can show them that in fact, you can care for your elders, you can have a livelihood and you can be in these economies of care and solidarity. To prove this in the United States, Nati Linares and I made this report that came out very recently in March. It's called Solidarity Not Charity, Arts and Culture Grant Making in the Solidarity Economy. We interviewed over 80 people. Many of them are pictured here on the Zoom. The summary of the report that Bina asked me to share with you is this. This report is about the ways that arts and culture grant makers can engage in systems change work that addresses root causes rather than symptoms of cultural inequity. The cultural sector is actively seeking alternatives to business as usual to create economic and racial justice in the sector and beyond. Grant makers can play a role in the transformation of the sector by following the lead of intersectional Black, Indigenous, and people of color creatives who are innovating models for self-determination and community wealth. This work is part of an emergent movement in the United States that is known globally as the solidarity economy. And here are some of the people that we interviewed. I think I saw Andres is in here who also was interviewed. So this is what the report looks like. I'm gonna take you through the logic that will be very familiar to all of us who are working in the arts. No one knows what arts and culture will look like after the pandemic. 63% of creatives have become fully unemployed in the United States. A third of museums say they're likely to close forever. Black and indigenous people have a COVID-19 death rate of double or more the death rate of white people in the United States. And yet foundation giving in the United States in 2020 documented that only 5% of pandemic response dollars were intended for communities of color, only 5%. Around half of 1% of annual foundation giving directly supports women and girls of color and less than half of 1% goes to Native Americans. So what would the cultural economy be like if it loved Black and Indigenous people? This is adapted from Jessica Norwood's question from Runway and used with permission. Here's what it might look like. And this is a pop quiz for those of you who went into multitasking. If you wanna come back for a moment, I have a pop quiz. I'm gonna see what comes to mind as I ask you these things. 
What do these organizations and movements have in common? The oldest native cooperative in the United States, the first democratically managed investment fund in the United States, the oldest non-extractive venture capital firm in the United States, an organization that gives 35,000 freelancers pensions, Black Lives Matter. They were all co-founded by artists and culture bearers and many of them were BIPOC, Black Indigenous people of color artists. So yeah, if you're interested in these groups, again, I could connect you after Koala Arts and Crafts is the oldest native co-op. The Boston Ujima project that I'll talk more about is the first democratic investment fund. The Working World is the oldest non-extractive venture capital firm. Smart.coop, many of you probably know, gives freelancers pensions, 35,000. Yes, and Patrice Cullors, who co-founded Black Lives Matter, is obviously an artist. So we are building the future now. We don't always wear our artist title or our artist hat when we're doing that work. But I think a lot of people on this Zoom know about how we move through these different spaces. And we can talk more about how you do that together and in your context. All around the country, these artists and culture bearers, often who have been most harmed by our current systems of neoliberal governance and racial capitalism, are practicing self-determination and community wealth building. And here are some of the examples that we go into in the report. I'll give you details about a few of them. Again, these initiatives have community ownership, democratic governance together for political, cultural, and economic power. This is from Namaka Agbo again. And I wanna give you an example of a few before we take a break and talk to each other and possibly I share a practice of collaboration in solidarity economies with you. The first one that Bina was asking me to share with you is the East Bay Permanent Real Estate Cooperative, which I am not a member of, but I am very inspired by. So I'm gonna share a video with you and you can know it's only around two minutes. So let's watch this video and then we can talk later about how you could get more involved and bring in some of the artists who are pictured here. Hi, I'm Noni. And I'm Greg. We're part of EB Prec, the, the East, East Bay, Bay Permanent, permanent Real, Real Estate Cooperative. Cooperative. We're a democratically run co-op that creates permanent, yes, permanent affordable housing in the East Bay that's owned by Black, Indigenous, and PLC locals like you, me, and Greg. Because I grew up in the flats of East Oakland. And I'm a third generation West Oakland native. I've raised my daughter in the same house I grew up in, and I believe that you have the right to do the same. Because housing is a human right. But we're in a housing crisis, and Greg and I have seen too many developers get rich off the displacement of our black and brown neighbors. That's why EB Prec is fighting back. How? Well, first we get local residents, you, me, Greg, your mom, your neighbor, to invest $1,000 a piece into our collective fund. With a lot of people, that's a lot of money. Then EB Prec uses that money to buy up properties in Oakland and the East Bay. We've already picked out properties where long-term tenants who are already serving our community are in danger of being pushed out. And once we buy the property, the people who already live and work there get to stay. And we train them on how to manage it cooperatively without any bosses or any landlords. Now remember everyone who invested in our fund? All those people now co-own and co-steward that land together, along with the people who live there. Real estate is always a solid investment. And with EB Prec, you'll be investing in not just a commodity, but a community. And you can get your money back plus some within 10 years. That's right. We're turning a racist, classist housing market into a tool that can build wealth for the people most disenfranchised by it. And we teach other groups how to do what we do so they can build on our hometown's radical legacy in the Black freedom struggle through organizing, land trusts, and co-ops. So as a community, what can we do? Well, we already have $100,000 in the bank, plus a great team of local staff and the same attorneys who helped change California law to make this all possible. Now, in order to buy the properties we've picked out, we need 400 people to invest so we can keep our community from losing their homes. With a $1,000 investment, you become a co-owner in the first two properties in Oakland, and you'll learn how to steward the land to correct the injustices of capitalism. 
Invest with us today to end displacement and create permanently affordable housing in the East Bay. Together, Together let's, let's keep, keep our community, community rooted. rooted. And again, I'll share this presentation so you can look at what they're doing at length. A uh, quick overview. Again, their mission is about stewarding land without landlords, which is a core part of the concept of the commons of collective stewardship. And another way of talking about the commons or the solidarity economy is restorative economics. So thinking about how to redistribute resources to people who have been most harmed and also who have ancestral traditions that they are reclaiming, which are already about restoration, repair, and shared ownership. And the last one here is healing people power. So thinking about democratic and nonviolent governance and ways to really practice stewarding space and resources together. This is a multi-stakeholder cooperative. And I'll say very briefly what that means is people who are investing in it are also owning it and running it and they share the benefits of that space so they have visualized this as a kind of molecular structure you can see the different spaces that they have here and the different kinds of ownership whether you're on staff like greg and noni who you saw pictured there whether you're an investor a community owner or a resident owner, you are involved in this project, this commoning, this mutual economy. And there are many people that you could talk to if you're interested in this. Here you see Miliaku Nabeze, who is an amazing community organizer and also artist and designer. So I encourage you to get in touch with Miliaku Wabeze if you're excited about this and you could have her come in and speak to your group. Also Annie McShiris, Greg Jackson, and the people that you saw in Noni Session are all involved and can talk to you about their work. I'm going to share two more examples with you and then we could open it up. The next one that I wanna share with you from the report that's a huge inspiration is the Boston Ujima project. And this is another very short video. I'm sharing with this with you also because you can see that often the media and representation of these projects is done very quickly and could be supported by artists like you. So even if you're very far away and you wanna learn about these groups, often you can get involved in the media working group or the media assembly and find ways to be invited into creating media about the commons with these groups. So these are a few examples and often they're very open to working with artists and designers to create uh, communications and media web infrastructure for these projects. So another two minute video. The current economy hasn't been working for us for some time. Boston Ujima Project is imagining something better. We are creating a community controlled local economy led by Boston's working class residents of color. How? A multi-stakeholder group comprised of community members, small business owners, workers, grassroots activists, impact investors, members of unions, faith and civic organizations, and hopefully you, will come together to form Boston Ujima Project's governing body. We will pool our resources in a community-controlled capital fund, and each of us will receive one vote, no matter how much we've invested, on decisions like which businesses and real estate initiatives we will invest in, and what community-centered business practices we would like them to uphold, like paying a living wage. We will do this at neighborhood assemblies, where we prioritize what's important for our specific neighborhoods, and at a citywide assembly, where we prioritize what's important for the city of Boston as a whole. Our Good Business Alliance will support businesses who receive funding from us with creative organizing, and by providing technical assistance, cooperative purchasing, and other joint ventures to strengthen operations and market share. Our Good Business Certification and Directory will highlight their healthy business practices to gain customer support and loyalty. Our Worker Services Network will support employees of BGMA businesses by organizing human resource offerings like an internal staffing agency and workplace mediation services to grow employee satisfaction 
and workplace security. Ujima members will have access to an internal electronic currency that offers Ujima consumers rewards at certified Ujima businesses. Ujima members will also access a time bank that allows for individuals to trade their skills and labor with their neighbors on an hour-to-hour -hour exchange. These currencies incentivize purchasing and trade within the Ujima network and grows local wealth by ensuring the circulation of resources within our communities. We will advance campaigns for the city, state, and large nonprofits to direct investment, subsidy, and procurement dollars to Ujima's network of certified good businesses and developers, as well as divesting from extractive industries like prisons and fossil fuels, and directing those dollars into our network instead. And finally, we will reinvest some of our returns and with each new investment cycle, continue to do, learn, and grow collectively as a community. Ujima, after all, is Swahili for collective work and responsibility, creating a new way of being, a new local economy. We're excited to announce that Boston Ujima Project is now open for membership. Rewrite the rules with us. Join us. So this gives you a sense, and the Boston Ujima Project is the first democratic uh, investment the fund economy. in the U.S., so that was when they were launching, and now it's been a number of years. So if you're interested in this, you could bring in James, who's here, or Sierra Peters, or Nia Evans. There are many people involved in the Boston Ujima Project, and they do have art at the center of their work. They have, as a common statement, artists are economy builders. And Nia Evans talks very wonderfully about how they're trying to create the air around this investment cooperative so that there's new norms around the solidarity economy or what you might call commoning or the commons or mutual economies. And that artists do this by making new norms. For example, Sierra Peters is an artist and DJ and threw a party for the very opening of the Boston Ujima project where everything in the music and in the way it was created was part of the solidarity economy. So if you're wondering how to get involved, I'd say contact them or you can contact me to put you in touch. And also there's most likely a solidarity economy initiative near you that you can directly join right where you are right now. So again, it's community ownership and democratic governance. I wanna share one more thing before we open it up. And this one is about the seed commons. Um, I'm not gonna share a video for economy. this one. So we don't uh, only watch videos, but you can look at seed commons on the web. And to summarize, it's a national network of locally rooted non-extractive loan funds that bring the power of big finance to community control. So it's an investment that is a single fund sharing capital for local deployment by and for communities, lowering the risk for investors while increasing impact. Seed Commons also shares backend services like peer learning to give members the tools necessary to succeed in accessing capital like market players and deploying it using local community relationships. So this is now 100 groups nationally that have a portfolio that's $15 million. And to share a little bit of what they've said, we take guidance from the grassroots and share capital and resources to support local cooperative businesses, building infrastructure necessary for a truly just, democratic, and sustainable economy. So you can go to seedcommons.org. What's really exciting for me about this is that it allows the hyper-local conditions that we each have to work in, which are very different, to come together at least at a national level, potentially international, to make a fund that is democratically controlled. So just like the Boston Ujima project, there are local assemblies that come into Boston and then the Boston Ujima project is part of Seed Commons as the larger network that is national. So you might imagine how in your context, you could be connected to something either in Seed Commons or your own national or regional uh, Ujima or Seed Commons and then have them interface with one another. 
And if you're interested in this, there's a video here. I'll share the link to this presentation and you can watch it. So to review, my parents did not want me to go into the arts. It becomes very personal for me to prove that there is a path to a livelihood and therefore economic justice is always connected to creativity. I want this path to be available to me and so many other people. So I'll always connect creativity to economic justice. I've been involved in co-founding a number of initiatives that aim to co-create economies of solidarity from the barter and mutual aid networks I mentioned to financing permanently affordable space. And I shared some examples that are really amazing that you could learn from right now that I'm learning from a lot in a peer study group that I can say more about if you want in the conversation we're about to have. And again, those examples were EB Prec or the East Bay Permanent Real Estate Cooperative, the Boston Ujima Project and Seed Commons. So let's let that sink in and then be in dialogue with each other. There is an entire other story I was going to tell about ways to make agreements with each other. So I'll put a link to this and you can learn about it. It's from the Sustainable Economies Law Center. And let's listen before we get into a conversation. Thank you so much for having me here. Thank you for being active in the chat that helped me know that you're here with me and I'm not just speaking into the void. Yeah. Thank Ina, you thank so you. much, Caroline. Um, wow, like um, just inside and outside of the, your presentation, full of uh, tools, also the uh, speed you were talking. <laughs> and the uh, interval intermissions with a bird a song. And also when you began, you ask us to share motivation where we are joining from here. I think all these are really precious tools that we can uh, use uh, in our uh, uh, other contexts uh, as well. And then these examples that you gave, uh, Oh, wow. <laughs> um, I don't know, it's because of the like existing subsidy system in uh, Western Europe to speak of myself. Uh, like why, like uh, in case of Casco, uh, the, the major, uh, major side of my practice, um, we have been like really like uh, strengthening, enriching diversifying our ecosystem. But however, there is such a weight on getting money from uh, the state. And there is the rule uh, that uh, state uh, or state authority brings in um, uh, perhaps, uh, yeah, it gives a certain security, but maybe also kind of slow down our uh, move uh, toward, uh, yeah, solidarity economies and commons. So what uh, the example that you showed coming out of where the state support uh, doesn't exist. <laughs> um, but it was really like a bottom up uh, collective uh, ownership model 
uh, so it's extremely empowering. But in order to take that up to uh, our practice, where we, wherever we are, um, uh, like, is it possible to share what were kind of uh, patterns of challenge or difficulty these uh, collectives uh, or organization ha had and how they dealt with? Yeah, I can only say what we learned from interviewing all the people for this report. I think, uh, of course, everyone's conditions are so specific. Um, and also, I would say, if you look at the really strong solidarity economy networks and institutions and um, assemblies internationally, often state support is very important in a kind of transitional commons, a moment to move from potentially this duality of private and public toward the commons or the solidarity economy. So this is a huge debate. What is the role of the state in this? And I am sharing one small thought, but I'm sure everyone in here has a very specific and strong opinion about it. Um, if you look at Mondragon, for example, in the Basque region in Spain, I don't know if anyone here is from there, you can see that there's so much support from the state and that is actually what enabled it. And if you look at like the Chantier region in Quebec, there's a lot of support. So I wouldn't say that it needs to happen at all without state support. And in fact, many people in the US are advocating for public procurement to get the goods from worker cooperatives and to have the small business councils in our areas, regions, to advocate for worker ownership. Because often there are a lot of resources to develop worker cooperatives. And we have had huge campaigns, especially in New York City, and huge wins to get money from New York City and New York State to support the development of worker cooperatives. So I think it's very important to say that we are not uh, encouraging you to follow our extreme austerity and uh, neoliberal approach. Um, that said, these are very grassroots uh, initiatives. And when we, Nati Lenaris and I were interviewing people, some of the main uh, barriers that they talked about were the pace, like the slowness of building relationships and that temporality, that slow trust building mm. is antithetical to the structure of philanthropy and also the structure of the electoral process, the ways that people ask for very quick impact with projects and very quick cycles. So in the report, we put in the recommendations that many people asked for, and I'm going to put that in. This is the actions that we asked uh, people to make, when, whether they're public sector uh, support grant makers or private sector philanthropy. There are things like they need to begin by conducting a power analysis and understanding what reparations might look like in their context. They need to do more somatic work. They need to be more involved in slowing down. So we have a whole list of internal work and then governance shifts that they need to make, like having more distributed leadership. Most people don't know how to be in a collective decision-making process. Um, other things like giving multi-year support, even that, you know, supporting something for five years or 10 years feels impossible mm -hmm. to so many public sector and private sector um, grant makers. So this is a huge shift and it is happening here in the US actually. And I think a field you're also doing this. Um, and I see Apollonia, your hand is raised, want to share something. Um, yeah, just to say that, uh, well, thank you so much, Caroline, for for this uh, talk, I have heard you in, on other occasion as well, and uh, look through your uh, PDF about uh, solidarity economy. Um, and again, uh, listening to you, uh, it reminded me, and I was kind of, you know, getting really aware of that, how uh, in former Yugoslavia, in Socialist Federative Republic of Yugoslavia, 
uh, we, we grow up with this philosophy of solidarity and how that actually got um, broken up or uh, in some way completely um, disconnected by uh, uh, the democratization process. Uh, so it's uh, lots of contradictions uh, within my personal history, let's say, uh, that deals with um, the ideas that you are introducing. And of course, they need to be reintroduced nowadays again and again. Uh, but within uh, my country, that is, um, that is really, really difficult right now <laughs> to introduce them uh, in terms in in uh, um, in even in the uh, level of the uh, yeah uh, society. Um, before you know, I'm that old that I remember a little bit uh, <laughs> the Socialist Republic of Yugoslavia. I grew up in there, so but I was too young really to. Uh, keep it all in my head, but actually we were taught of how to organize uh, ourselves in order to be solidaire, even as a kind of small pioneers. <laughs> and um, uh, this is now coming back and I think I'm gonna, you inspired me to look into this more. To, uh, I was trying to look uh, while you were talking uh, actually uh, into Google and I think it's very little um, published about it. Uh, it seems uh, it's very, um, well, a kind of debate that has been introduced in, uh, in the time of communist Yugoslavia on a sp with specific language on specific level again. Uh, at the end, everybody hated it. <laughs> uh, but I think that you make a point is really, really important to reinvent, reintroduce um, uh, also within uh, the, the, the ex-communist, uh, you know, um, states, uh, that kind of systems. So thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's so interesting to think about this difference from the extreme individualization of the US, even culturally, in like the way we are encouraged to tell the story of ourselves, for example, the way I did that in the talk. It's just such different contexts that we're trying to connect here. I really appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, but there's a question in the chat. Isone Sadava. Isone, you would you mind speaking? Yeah, great. Ah, you are muted. So could you unmute? Great. How are you? Well, firstly, I would like to thank you because uh, your presentation was really helpful. Um, um, I was I was writing a little bit about it on the on the chat because I think that funding and finding a, a way of doing it apart from the from the public or the state funding is always a, a big issue for for all, all of us um, you were uh, briefly talking about the uh, past country in Spain and it happens that I'm uh, uh, talking to you from Bilbao it is, it is true that we have a lot of support, which is something I'm really grateful because uh, it really helps us begin a lot of projects that otherwise uh, it wouldn't be possible to, to, to develop. Um, in the rest of Spain, uh, um, I know that they don't have the same situation, most of the places. Um, and I have to say that, uh, that the government here is quite open-minded in that sense. But it is true that uh, uh, becoming dependent of that money, uh, it's really weakening because uh, 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 the thing is that the moment you don't get it for any reason, the project goes, goes down, it disappears. So even in, in, even in this situation, I think that the, um, the government support or the, or the state support, is, it, it is good in the beginning. Uh, but uh, but uh, right away, you have to, you have to find um, um, uh, the structure, right? You, you need to find your own 
structure your your own way of uh, of making your project uh, um, lasting in time, which I think is an, is a really important thing for any any uh, initiative, any project, that it can last in the so something that I found is that even if that, if that money seems to be for free, it's never for free. So it also has uh, um, these political taxes, right? So, so I think that, well, uh, it has two faces. Uh, could, could we just, I think we should piggyback because I think Sruti's question is uh, quite uh, it kind of in the same vein. So we could potentially go there and piggyback and then create that conversation. Sure. Yeah, I'm happy to, to like, uh, yeah, what to do with the state reliance or how we can be more free and sustainable uh, yeah, from, from the state support. And then uh, what could be the role of NGO? I think that's the question from Sruti but not, not to make it too uh, heavy and big, but like, I just like to mention, we shouldn't forget about also the question from Zikiri as well, where there is no, uh, not only state support, but also there are like group of people who like to organize themselves, but they don't have any access to basic because they are not even recognized as a citizen by state. If I summarize right. Yeah, I'm reading this. Uh, okay, would love to know, uh, looking at a uh, praxis model of solidarity economy that are working with these forms of community. Um, yeah, I think it's hard to make a parallel. I don't want to say this is similar or the same, but I do think that um, there are so many um, groups in the US who have been so disinvested and so um, policed and made uh, unable to access forms of finance and education and uh, rights to voting. And uh, many of the solidarity economy projects in the United States in our history come out of that reality. So for example, um, being able to have the right to vote as a black man in the US, in the original version of the freedom movements often required ownership of land in order to vote. So the pooling of money to own land, like in Weeksville in, the, in New York now in the US, this came from that history. And I think if you look at the solidarity economy research that's happening in the US solidarity economy network, or the Community Economies Research Network, you could find more people who are working on that. Um, and then in terms of NGOs and this uh, question of what the government can do to begin the support, I agree with you, it shouldn't be permanent, but to begin the startup support that allows a lot of these projects to get off the ground and then they can be more radical and self-sustaining. If you look at the people that we mention here, um, who's actually doing this work under action, there are pretty amazing examples of foundations spending down their money so that they eventually don't exist, investing in solidarity economy initiatives. And if you look at Namaka Agbo's uh, restorative economies website, you can see a lot of really radical work that's happening here in the US. Um, I also want to mention that we are forming a peer learning and study group in the US across these different groups that were interviewed for the report. So if you're interested in knowing more about the US uh, United States context and the emergent movement, we'll be launching that in the fall. So September through October, we'll be studying together and pushing each other into action. So we call it study into action for a praxis of solidarity economy with arts and culture at the center. And uh, you could email me to find out about that. We don't have the website up yet. Um, it's just my name at Gmail. And I do have a little baby. So if I don't respond, you have to remind me within a month or a week, be like, I'm still here. Um, and I'd love to hear 
answers and questions from everybody here because I am not an expert. I am unlearning. You know, I call myself like a reparations program officer. So as a white woman, a lot of my work is like, how can I make those connections and use the privileges that I have to be in service of this real debt that needs to be paid? And in this work, I think there's a lot of room for people across intersectional positions to find their right position. So as an artist, but also as a white woman, I can be, we call ourselves also the white fragility doulas and the reparations program officers to think about what is your role in this work? There is a role for everybody. And I'm happy to talk to you about what your place might be if you feel uncomfortable. Uh, yeah, there's a place for all of us in this. Um, uh, that could be connected to question from Sandra. It's on the chat. Uh, but Sandra, you'd like to reiterate the question? Sure. I I also have a baby crying, which is why. Oh, okay. <laughs> but, uh, no, yeah, my question was, was uh, asking Carolyn to go back to the idea of systemic change. Um, but it seems very like a core idea with the idea of reparation in your work, and you went quite fast. So how do we go from social change to systemic change? When did it happen? And why do you think it's the center point? Yeah, I think a way that Brendan Martin, who is at Seed Commons, talks about it is, especially if we're talking about funding and ways to shift funding, imagine that every philanthropy is investing all of their money in the problems of the world that are causing climate crisis, accelerating the structural violence around us. And then they take less than 5% and put it into grants. How is change going to happen if that's the case? If I took 95% of the grant money that someone gave me and did the exact opposite of what I was supposed to do, like let's say made communities more divided, more hating each other, more filled with gossip, and then for 5% of my time tried to solve the conflict, tried to give more repair, how would the foundation respond, you know? So if all of the money that is funding this is going into exacerbating the conditions that we're trying to work on, what kind of social change can happen? So until we actually change the investments, the money managers actually shift where the money goes. And we think about forms of governance that help us hold each other together in this shift so that it isn't just the words that we speak in spaces like this. It's actually what we know we need to do. That is the really hard work that we'll, we will resist every day. That is when the change will happen. And so it is systemic. Yeah, it's about um, trying to live into the worlds that we want to see every day. Yeah, with our babies and with each other and in our strange spaces that we find each other in on Zoom. Um, and it's really hard work and we're all on a journey. It takes a lot of empathy and it's very slow. But I do think in the US, there's a lot of grant makers who are really ready for the shift. And they actually say, tell us where to put the money. And so I don't know if you have that in your context, it's a real privilege and we're trying to make it more international, more about diasporic support. This is also part of the work. Um, but yeah, I have some hope here and that is my work um, as my reparations program officer, white fragility doula. And yeah, I feel so privileged to be in this space. It's a real honor. Thank you, Amy, for writing me that email out of the blue and connecting me to Bina and for trusting me, Bina and Mao and Abby. And I hope that as a group, people can stay in touch with each other. Um, we are hosting a workshop, but I think it's relatively closed, but we could potentially do another conversation where people talk about how to support each other. You can also join the New Economy Coalition if you want to learn more about what's happening in the US. Nati Linares is a communications organizer there who I collaborated with on the report. So you can learn about what's happening nationally here. And I appreciate you being present on this Friday. I know it's the end of the day for some of you. Yeah, thank you, Avi, for holding the space. 
Um, thank you. I mean, you held the space and you did a really, really lovely job. Uh, and thank you, Bina, for moderating. I have a, I have a faint feeling that Mao has a question that's being repressed as we speak. <laughs> No, no, don't worry. I mean, it was just um, it was just a comment, and um, and my comment is really to thank you because I think the space you created is a very democratic space. If you want to use this word, in the way you connect this various tradition of uh, reparation, of cooperativism, of solidarity economy in Brazil, you, you bring together really a, a practical example for different parts of the world and different uh, discipline and backgrounds. So I think that the systemic change comes from the connection you're making. And, and that's for me, it's incredibly inspiring and enriching. So just- um, Thank you, it's very nerve wracking. I'm really just one person and there are a lot of people really doing this work for generations. So yeah, thank you. And let's hope we use our power in elite art institutions to really make the change that is necessary for people who will never know about this Zoom.